Great morning, City Church. It is my duty to dismiss City Kids. Can we clap for them? We have been, oh, let me introduce myself. I am Stevie Wonderful. I am one of the pastors here. I'm married to Mr. Wonderful, as you've heard before. And I'm excited to bring what God's put on my heart for you today. We've been in a series called Mixtapes. I don't know if it's a series, but it's what we do in the summer. And we have different pastors, different preachers, different people come speak here. And the summer's a time when we take vacations. There are options. The weather's great. And there are a lot of things to do. But can I encourage you to lean in and not check out? In the amplified version of Mark 4 and 24, it says, let me tell you. It says, we usually use the scripture as it pertains to giving. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will be given back to you. But in Mark 4 and 24 in the Amplified, it says, pay attention to what you hear by your own standard of measure, that is, to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, it will be measured back to you, and you will be given even greater ability to respond, and more will be given to you besides. So how you show up is how you grow up. So let's jump right into the word. I could talk, and I talk a lot, and it's my unique brilliance is words. That's what God's gifted me with, and you might leave here if I just talk to you with some words worth repeating, something catchy to say, but the unique brilliance of the Bible is that it's the word of God. It's God-breathed, it's alive, it's active. It's able to divide between the soul and the spirit, the thoughts and intents. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, it says it effectively works in you who believe. So today, instead of me just talking, I want to say what God has to say so that you'll leave changed or at very least wanting to want to change. So I'm going to start this morning by making you a little scripture sandwich. I am not widely known for cooking, but I'm going to attempt a little breakfast sandwich for you. It may be a little kind of like a Philly cheesesteak sandwich in that it could be messy. Um, I'm going to use Jeremiah bread. So Jeremiah 1 and 5 and I believe it might come up on the screen, says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God talking to us. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Most of us were not ordained prophets to the nations, but we were ordained something by God. And the second verse is 2 Corinthians 7, 5, and 6. Paul's talking, and he says, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God. We could just stop right there. I could stop. <laughs> Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us. And then another Corinthian scripture is 2 Corinthians 4. In an earlier part of that book, it says we're hard pressed on every side, but it talks about we're not destroyed, we're not crushed. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18, it says, therefore, we do not lose heart. This is where it gets good. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And why, we'll, why we do not look at the things which are seen for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And the other piece of bread is Jeremiah 29, 11. We know it well. For I, this is God again for us. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Their thoughts, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. The, ampli the King James Version says that he has an expected end for us, for you, and for me. So we're going to look at how this unfolds in the book of Ruth and add some secret sauce. But let's start with prayer. God, we thank you for your word, that it is powerful. I ask that you bless me to communicate it effectively today, that I'd be transparent and that they would see you through me. I present myself humbly, God, because if, if I say, if I make my point and I miss yours, then 
this is pointless. But, and if I say a bunch of words and they're void of your word, then it's powerless. So I invite you today to help me appropriate what's appropriate as I speak today, God. That your word would be as powerful in my mouth today as the day that you first spoke it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm not going to read through the whole book of Ruth, although it's four, cha- four chapters. So I encourage you to read through the whole book of Ruth. But today I'm going to give you a, I was going to say Reader's Digest version, but I, I don't even know if you know what Reader's Digest, half the people in here know what Reader's Digest. So I'll say Cliff Notes version. Um, and I can't see my notes. So the Cliff Note version of Ruth. It starts with a man named Elimelech. Pronunciation doesn't count against me. I wasn't there. Elimelech (laughs) means God is king. His wife was Naomi and his sons, again, I'm going to call them. I'm going to call my boys Malan and Chilion because I don't really know how to pronounce their names. But they left the land of Judah because of a famine. They were righteous people. God is king. And over time, there were two weddings and a funeral. Elimelech died. And the two sons married two women. Enter, these are Moabite women, so they're in a foreign land because there was no food where they were. Enter Orpah and Ruth. These are the two daughters-in-law of Naomi now. And 10 years pass, and the sons die. Uh, A note to all my single ladies. The sons' names mean sickly and failing. If you go on a blind date with a guy, and his name is sickly or failing, It's okay if he's blind, but if his name's sickly or failing, buy him dinner and bounce. (laughs) Just saying. So the famine ends. Naomi blesses the daughter. She's going to go back to her country because there's food. Um, And she starts to go with the daughters-in-law, and then she tells them, no, I bless you. May God deal kindly with you as you've dealt with me and as you've dealt with the dead. And the women cry because... That's what we do. And they say, no, no, Naomi, we're going to stay with you. And then Naomi starts ifing things up. She says, if I had hope and if I had a husband and if I had babies today, would you wait for them to grow up so you could marry them? She says, no, stay. (laughs) So the ladies cry again. But here's the point of decision. Orpah kisses and Ruth clings. Orpah kisses Ruth goodbye, and she stays in her country. And Ruth, she clings to her mother-in-law. So Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem, and it's harvest time. And Ruth has a bit of an identity crisis, which you'll hear in a moment. It's not Ruth. Naomi has a bit of an identity crisis as they return. But Ruth is expectant. She says in Ruth 2, 2 and 3, she, she asked Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. She's looking for favor. She's expecting favor. Guess what you find when you're looking for favor and expecting favor? Favor. But Naomi entered the city bitter. Guess what you find when you're bitter? Drama, trauma, and you're usually the one inflicting it. The rest of the story is that, indeed, Ruth happens upon favor. And she ends up marrying a man that's part of the family, which was the custom in that day so that they could have children. And, be, and she was in the lineage of a Christ. So often we get what we expect. So the title of my message is Faith Funnel. Colon, what is your circumstance? Thanks, Lan. These are funnel. And I'm not, I'm not dressed up, but I'm dressed appropriately. This looks like this, kiss on my shirt. So it's just a reminder that every time you're trying to not eat the kisses that are in the bowl, just don't. It looks like the whirlwind of life on my shirt. If you turned it upside down, it looks like the minutia and the monsoons of life. So I'm calling this faith, the faith funnel. And the top of my shirt says kisses. God has in store for us as we filter things through the faith funnel. Heaven kisses. He's got something good, an expected end in store for us. 
But wait, <laughs> there's more. That's not the only funnel. That's the faith funnel. That's the one we want to utilize. But there's another. There's the family funnel. The things I learned in my culture, in my family of origin. The things that I know that I know that I think that I know. But it's not just black and white. There's the factors funnel. There's facts and there's actors. There's circumstances whirling around. We could also call these the culture. What did I call them? We could call them conditioning, the family filter. We could call this circumstances, the factors. And we could call this the cross, faith. So we're going to look at how to use our faith funnel today. We're going to start with Naomi's identity crisis, which I alluded to earlier. Naomi means pleasant. Grateful, grateful people tend to be more pleasant than bitter, complaining people. And did you know that it's the will of God for you, that you're grateful, that you're thankful? You say, prove it, Steve. I got you. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, it says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. It's right there. It's so easy. No, it's so simple, <laughs> but it's not so easy. So let's look at Naomi's identity crisis. She didn't fully know how to use, appropriate the faith funnel. It says, in everything, give thanks. Not necessarily for everything. Naomi got it a little twisted. In Ruth 1, 20 and 21, she says, in response to the ladies when she's coming back into her city, and they're like, is this Naomi when she comes back into Bethlehem? And she's like, no, just call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Naomi means pleasant. Uh, she's reflecting wrong. And you know what happens when you get a distorted reflection? You know what Naomi spells backwards? I moan. That's a bummer. She took on that personality because she got it twisted. She forgot that she had Ruth. She forgot clearly she has friends because they're excited to see her. She forgot that she had her life even though her husband and her boys had died. She got it twisted. She lost perspective. And you know why? You know how? Because life happened. She had crisis over crisis over crisis over crisis. And you know what crisis plus crisis is? It's crises. You know what crises are? Things that make you cry and they try to seize your joy and they try to seize your peace and they try to seize your faith and they try to seize your hope. But you know what crisis means in Greek? It means decide. There's a point of decision when a crisis comes in your life. Naomi decided to use the factors funnel. It turned her bitter. And maybe you know someone who's bitter. Maybe you've been someone who's bitter. But the rest of the title was, what is your circumstance? The definition of circum, like the circumference of a circle is around, about. It implies encompass, encircle, and stance. Stance is something that you deliberately adopt. It's a deliberately adopted way to stand. It's an attitude of a person towards something. You know what a deliberately adopted way to stand is? It's when Superman puts on his cape. <laughs> That's a stance. So we're going to look at Ruth and three stances that she demonstrated in the Bible. And take note, I read in a devotional, it said, sometimes God has to balance what he's doing in your life with what he's doing in someone else's life to make all things work together for good. It is good. Sometimes not for us immediately, but you just got to choose the right funnel. So the first stance, excuse me, the first 
stance that Ruth took was compassion. In Ruth 1 and 8, Naomi goes on a bit of a rant when she's saying, go home, stay where you are, stay with your family, marry somebody in your tribe, don't come with me, and if this happens, and if that would happen. So Naomi is coming at Ruth with passion. She's coming with passion, and you know how Ruth responds? With compassion. You know what the definition of Ruth is? Companion, friend, vision of beauty. Ruth was ride or die. She was sticking it out. In D.C., you may have encountered one or two people that are passionate. <laughs> they can honk this horn in point three, four, two seconds after the light changes green. They've got their soapbox tucked under their arm waiting to step up and tell you what they think about what they think about. Um, and because they want to be heard, sometimes they yell. <laughs> but you know what? We get to have the divine response when we'll just filter it through our faith funnel. We get to have the divine response and we get to lend them our faith and our faith funnel if necessary. There's something called the ministry of presence. It's something many of us have done without even knowing it. When somebody dies, we don't know what to say to the person who's lost someone. But sometimes you just go not say anything. You just sit. You're just there. Job's friends were silent for a long time, and then they started talking, and they jacked everything up. So sometimes it's great to just have the ministry of presence. So we get to do that for passionate people that we encounter. We get to be a friend. God gave me a definition of friend years ago that says, a friend is someone who knows you well enough not to be impressed with you, yet treats you like you're impressive. Yeah, we all need a friend like that. Guess what? If you don't have a friend like that, you are in the right place. This is a great community, the city church. The second stance that Ruth showed us, I messed it up. The second stance that Ruth shows us is righteousness. In Ruth 1, in Ruth 1 and 15, Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and back to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. That's the decision point. Kiss or cling to God. And there's a reward that comes with choosing righteousness. In Joshua 1 and 7, it says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. There's a reward for righteousness. You know what? Orpah stayed where she was. She did the right thing. That's what was expected. That was customary. She stayed with her family. Nothing wrong with that. It was right, but she didn't choose God, so it wasn't righteous. Fair enough, right? Because she chose the family funnel. Okay. Uh, I bet she had a great life, but we never hear about her again. Fun fact, Oprah Winfrey, you heard of her, household name. She was supposed to be named after the never heard from again, Orpah. However, I don't know if it was a typo on her birth certificate or people just mispronouncing it that a household name like Oprah was supposed to be Orpah. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> the third stance that Ruth demonstrates for us is forgiveness. In Ruth 1 and 8, it says that Naomi, when Ruth said, I'm going to stay with you, Naomi stopped talking to her. And another version says, she said nothing more. Now, I think it really means that she didn't say anything more on the subject. But have you ever done the right thing, the righteous thing, and got a wrong response from, from some of those passionate people in this city? Uh, 
But then we have a choice. Ruth chose to love Naomi, irrespective of her behavior. And Naomi's coming back into the city bitter. So I'm sure she had some future transgressions. But what God told me years ago when I was having trouble forgiving someone, I was like, I've gone through this time and time again. I feel like I've forgiven them. What's the problem? And he told me that you forgave them of everything from here past. But what you haven't done is given them a future. You're holding them suspect. And your forecast, F-O-R-E, forecast for them is always cloudy. You're always waiting for something to happen. And that's the kind of forgiveness I'm talking about, F-O-R-E, that we give for, forgive people for what they're going to do. Because they're going to do something offensive at some point. So are you. And I am more than certain, so am I. I was thinking about if you've ever gotten a bill and you've paid it all, and everything's electronic now, but in the olden days, paid in full, they would stamp it with the red P-I-F, read like the blood of Jesus, that our sins were paid in full. And because he paid in full, we get to pay it forward. So next time somebody comes at you crooked, does something that's not kind or not merited, and you feel like you owe me an apology, the divine response would be to hand them that bill that they owe you, paid in full. That's forgiveness. So we've learned today from Ruth how to have a compassion, how to have a righteous and righteousness, and how to have a forgiveness, F-O-R-E. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my stance. My name is Stevie Wonderful. Although on any given day and any given hour and any given second of any day, I'm not behaving wonderfully. I'm not feeling wonderfully. I may not look wonderful. But my confession is always, if you ask me on the worst day, how am I? I might cry it out, but I'll say I am wonderful. Because that's my confession. I battled depression for decades. And I said a lot of not wonderful things about myself. On paper, I was crazy. In person, I was crazier. I was crazy. Um, I'm diagnosed, I was diagnosed as bipolar. So as a teenager, I was on Prozac, and I was the butt of all the jokes. But mental illness, it's not a joke. And there's help. If you need help, it's okay to get help. The Bible talks about prayer and a poultice. So if you need medication, if you need talk therapy, we all need talk therapy. Go for it. Shame. We learned something at the WAVE conference, a conference we used to go to as a church, and it was shame off you. So that's my confession today. In, in Psalms 139 and 14, it says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I was reading that one time, and all I saw was, I am wonderful. That's what God said to me, and that's now my yeah, and I'm on, it says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. And now, that's my desire, that's my mission in life. Is that Philemon 1, 6 says, Philemon, there's only one chapter, so 1, 6 says that the sharing of my faith would be effective because I acknowledge every good thing in me in Christ Jesus. My mission is, my mission statement is that the sharing of my faith in God in people and in the gifts that he's placed in them would become effective because I acknowledge every good thing that is in me in Christ Jesus. So when the mayhem and minutia is swirling around, when we filter it and funnel it through the faith funnel, you know what comes out? A method. God gives us a direction. And then what we decide to do, that determines whether we end up with a message or a mess of a life. So consider this story quickly. There's three pots of water, three 
In English, there's three pots of water on a stove. They're boiling. And into one, carrots. Carrots are hard. They're placed into the pot of water. And into the second, ground coffee. And into the third, eggs. The original story says eggs. I say cracked eggs because I think we're all a little cracked. I'll speak for myself. I know I'm a little cracked. And sometimes, although there's a hard shell, sometimes some of the insides can ooze out and it can be a little messy. But after boiling each of those, after they encounter the 212 temperature, the carrots that started off hard come out soft and mushy. The cracked egg that started off hard on the outside and soft on the inside is hard all the way through. But you know what happens to the ground coffee? It says, you're not going to take over me. My stance is I'm going to change the environment that I'm in. So what's your stance? I'll leave you with this. A quote from John Wooden. Wooden? I'm not sure which one it is. Wooden? Um, football coach. He says, okay. I don't like basketball. That doesn't matter because he's still a basketball coach apparently. He says, there is a choice you have to make in everything you do. But in the end, but keep in mind that in the end, the choice you make makes you. I could drop the mic right there, but I'd rather pray for you. God, can we bow our heads and close our eyes? I'm just going to incorporate us all into this prayer. God. Would you help us today silence all the competing voices, the voices that compete with what you said about us, what you said to us, what you said for us, and that we would appropriate the, pro the appropriate of your word, God. And today we would decide to employ our faith funnel to walk in compassion, to walk in righteousness, to walk in pure-hearted forgiveness. Thank you, God. We receive it today, your word, that it would be powerful, powerful in our lives even this week. And there's one more group of people, one more group that I'd like to pray for today. Maybe you're like, I, I only have the family filter and the circumstance, the factors filter. I don't even have a faith filter because I, I don't know this Jesus. So today... If you'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to count to three. Today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. He's saving you. He's rescuing you. One, if you want to know Jesus, if you want to start a relationship today, would you just raise your hand? Two, he split time in two so that you would know him. So that even though you're a sinner, because we're all sinners, that there's a savior, a rescuer, a hope for your life. Three, if that's you today and you want to know Jesus today, would you raise your hand? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That today we begin and we take a new st stance irrespective of the circumstances going on around us. And let's just all pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice for me. That you loved me when I wasn't lovable that you rescued me from sin and you gave me a hope and a future. I believe that you died for me, that you rose again, and that you call me Christian today. I thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Can we clap today?